Hey, Harbor West and guests, thanks so much for tuning in to our second week of live streaming uh, here. Uh, for the next three weeks, we're going to be looking at one chapter in the Bible as we get ready for Easter. And so if you have a Bible at home, you can grab it now and turn to Hebrews chapter 13. Um, if you don't have a Bible around you right now, that's fine. You can uh, follow along with the text on our screen here. Uh, Hebrews is a really incredible book. And because we're only going to be looking at the very last chapter, I want to take just one minute to give us kind of a, a brief overview of what's going on in the book. The preacher who wrote this book almost 2,000 years ago uh, wrote it to a church or group of churches kind of in and around Rome at the time. And uh, he wrote it uh, with a lot of rich Old Testament allusions. He talked about the Old Testament a lot. And so he probably knew that those people who are going to be reading this letter knew a lot about the Bible, a lot about the Old Testament. And so they were probably believers, followers of Jesus for a while. And it seems like they had already gone through some pretty intense trials. Because in chapter 10, he talked about them uh, losing possessions, having their possessions taken away, being ridiculed and mocked. He says they endured a hard struggle with sufferings. And so these people are, are resilient. They've been through it, had their faith tested, and, and they're still following Jesus. But the things he says now as he's writing the book of Hebrews makes it pretty clear that they're going through maybe an even more intense trial right now. Their faith is being challenged. Their contentment is being challenged. Their joy, their patience, their endurance, their love, it's all being challenged right now. They're probably wondering, where is Jesus in all of this struggle in life? What does it look like to follow Jesus when our world is being turned upside down? And so that's why we're calling this three-week series Raised for This. Because what the author of Hebrews says over and over again is that Jesus, he lived, he, he came, he died, and he was raised for this time. For a time where it seems like life is being turned completely upside down. Like, look at what he says in Hebrews 10. He says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have boldness to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus, he has inaugurated for us a new and living way. He's saying that Jesus bought for us, inaugurated, started for us a new and living way to live our lives. Even in the midst of trials, in, in the middle of life being turned upside down, in, in the middle of a lockdown and a pandemic, Jesus purchased for us a new and living way for life. Jesus lived for this. He died for this. He was raised for this. So let's dig in and see what kind of life Jesus inaugurated for us right now. Look at verse 1. Hebrews 13. He says, Let brotherly love continue. Don't neglect to show hospitality, for by doing this, some have welcomed angels as guests without knowing it. Let brotherly love, and, and, and this means sisterly too. What, what he's really saying in here is let family love continue. Because in the Bible, we read that God is our Father. And here in Hebrews, he's already said that Jesus is kind of like our, our first brother. And so we are family. That's what he says in, in Hebrews 2. Look at that. He says, For in bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was an entirely appropriate that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through suffering. For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one Father. That's why Jesus is not ashamed to call them, that's us, brothers and sisters. We're family. If you're a follower of Jesus, you have family, brothers and sisters in your church, in your community, all around the world, who are united to you as family because we have the same Father. So guys, the new and living way that Jesus inaugurated for us to live is that we love each other sacrificially. We love each other sacrificially because we love each other like family. 
Now, that's a command there, to let brotherly love continue. And I think that's really helpful for us right now because a lot of times we just wonder what we should be doing during trials, during suffering, during difficulty in life. We, we cry out to God, God, what should I do during this? Right here, he tells us, let brotherly love continue. Don't stop loving your brothers and sisters in Jesus. No matter how hard the trials get, no matter where the suffering leads, don't stop loving your family. Maybe he said this because he knows that during difficult times, we tend to get really uh, self-absorbed. We, we, we protect ourselves in a lot of ways. We stop thinking about others and we just focus on our own situation. So here he encourages us to look up from our own trials, see what's going on in the lives of our brothers and sisters, and love them in what they're going through. When we see it, he says in verse 2, don't neglect to show them hospitality. The idea there is treating a person, even someone you don't know very well, with love and welcome. Because during the time this was written, uh, inns or kind of like hotels or motels at the time, they were incredibly expensive for a traveler to stay at and they had a pretty sketchy reputation. And so really what he's saying here is welcome people into your homes. Open up your home, open up your life and let people in. Now, that is going to be sacrifice, right? What's going to happen if you open up your home, open up your life, and let tons of people in? They're going to make a mess, right? They're going to come in and, and just wreck your place. They're going to sit in your favorite chair. They're going to eat your food. They're going to drink your drinks. They're probably going to clog your toilets. I mean, it's going to get messy. It's going to be a sacrifice. But guys, that's what Jesus did for us. He sacrificed for us. He came to where we are. He, he welcomed in our mess into his life and he sacrificed for us to show us that the way of following him is the way of sacrificing for others. So guys, our new and living way to love right now is by loving each other sacrificially because that's the truly beautiful way that Jesus lived. And that's what we need right now. People living beautifully. Maybe we can't do that by actually welcoming people into our homes during this lockdown, during this pandemic. But here's something I want to ch challenge us with as a church, or if you're listening to this. Maybe sit down one day this week and just pray and say, God, if there's people you want me to love sacrificially, show me who they are. And take out your phone, open up your contacts app, and just start scrolling through, reading the names thinking about the people who maybe you haven't reached out to in weeks or months or, or years. And as, as the Spirit leads, reach out to those people. Text them, call them, and just say, hey, crazy time we're living in right now, right? How are you doing? Are you all right? H how are you? How's your family? Is, is there anything you need at all that maybe I could help you with or I could ask my church to help you with? reach out, take that time, instead of turning on Netflix or doing something else, sacrificially reach out to people, reconnecting in relationship, and look for ways to love them. Or you know, a, a lot of restaurants right now are delivering, or they're, they're doing curbside pickup. Love your neighbors or someone in your church by ordering them dinner. Tell them, hey, tonight I, I love you, I, I just want to bless you, dinner's on me. Here's the restaurant, here's the menu, you text me what you want, go pick it up at 6 p.m. I don't know, look for ways that people are in need or that you can be a blessing and just love each other sacrificially during this time. Let brotherly love continue during this season. Don't shy away from that. That's the new and beautiful way that Jesus has inaugurated for us to live in as his followers. There's a second way. Look at verse 3. In verse 3, he says, Remember those who are in prison, as though you were in prison with them, and the mistreated, as though you yourselves were suffering bodily. Now, uh, people in prison at this time, they weren't given basic needs to survive. 
very often. I mean, a lot of times they had to rely on people on the outside, family and friends, to bring them even some of the most basic necessities for life. These prisoners were people who were in their lowest point of life. Their, their, their normal life had been stripped away. They were living in terrible conditions, being neglected, mistreated. Guaranteed it was worse than any at-home work environment that you're living in right now. These people were in a low, terrible situation. The preacher's saying this right here. He's saying, remember them as though you were with them, being treated the same way. Here's what I think he's telling us. He's telling us that Jesus was raised so that we can love people who are hurting. Love those who are hurting. First, by remembering them. To remember here means to keep them present in your thoughts. Because again, we tend to be so self-focused and self-consumed during trials and difficulty. It's easy to forget what anyone else is going through. But here, he says, keep these people who are hurting in your thoughts, as if you were right there with them, going through what they're going through. That's what he says, right? As though you yourselves were suffering bodily. When Jesus was asked what the greatest commands are, he said that the first greatest command is to love God. And then look what he says is the second. The second is love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other command greater than these. Love your neighbor as yourself. So when our neighbor's hurting, we, we should treat them the way we'd want to be treated when we're hurting. And guys, there are many people around us who are hurting right now. We're starting to hear stories of people who are losing their jobs because of this lockdown. We're starting to hear stories of people who um, are struggling financially to know how they're going to buy some basic necessities in life. We're hearing stories of people who are um, becoming crippled with fear about what this is going to mean. We're hearing stories of people who are testing positive for this. Our neighborhoods and communities are bursting with opportunities for the church of Jesus to display his beauty in how we love people who are hurting right now. Jesus tells us how we should do it. J just listen to what he says in Matthew 25. He says this, For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. And the people answered him and said, Lord, when did we see you in all of these ways and do these things? And the king will answer them, truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it for me. Who in your life is hurting right now? You are in their life, God ordained sovereignly in their life to feed them, to give them drink, to take them in, to clothe them, to care for them, to visit them, to do anything you can to love them while they're hurting. The new and living way for us to live beautifully as followers of Jesus is to love people who are hurting. How are you going to do that? This week, this month, as this pandemic drags on, how are you going to love people who are hurting? Look at verse 4. There's another way. Verse 4 says, Marriage is to be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept undefiled, because God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterers. Guys, God cares about our marriages, and even, especially when we're going through times of heightened trials, we need to reaffirm our commitments within marriage. Because adulterers here are people who betray their marriage vows by, by cheating on their spouse. The sexually immoral is anyone involved in sexual activity outside of marriage, and both here are dishonoring to marriage. Both are dishonoring to God. But guys, Jesus was raised to open a new and living way for us to think about marriage and approach it. And, and here's what it is. Jesus was raised so that we would love our spouse. Jesus was raised so that we can love our spouse. 
not abandon your spouse when times get tough, not, not go looking for satisfaction and pleasure somewhere else when we feel like we aren't getting it from our spouse, but to honor our commitment, to honor our marriage by loving them. The word here, honor, means to give respect or value to, to give respect or value to your marriage. It's kind of like getting a new car, right? Maybe you've, you've had this experience or you know about this when you get a new car and it's nice and clean, kind of looks like this maybe, just looks wonderful inside, the interior is great, and you want to protect it. You want to make sure that it's clean, pristine, uh, just pure all the time, right? And so you set up some rules. Maybe one of your rules, I'm sure one of your rules is there's no eating in this car. You tell your friends, you tell your family, there's no eating in this new car, ever. You know what, we're not even gonna bring food into this new car because I don't wanna mess up the smell, right? I wanna keep that smell as long as possible. In fact, you know what, you're outside of my car, looking at my car with food in your hand, no, no, walk away, no food near the car, right? But then time wears on, you park your car, at the grocery store and you come out and there's that ding in the side, then you kind of bump something and there's that scratch on the front bumper, then you're driving home one day and the fries are in the passenger seat and those smell so good, you, you take some, and as time wears on, this pristine car starts to look like this, right? Eventually, this is exactly what all of your cars look like. I know, I know this is what it looks like. I've gotten in some of your cars like this, where there's a fry right there who knows what's in between the seats. I mean, you just let it go. You're not taking care of it anymore. It's just there to meet your needs. Maybe you even start looking for a different car, a newer car. Guys, loving our spouse looks like valuing our marriage by investing time, energy, money, and emotions into our spouse. Loving our spouse looks like respecting marriage by not pursuing anyone else in any way. And many of us now have loads of gifted time to be pursuing our spouse in love. So here's the challenge for those of us who are married right now. Have a date night once a week in your home just in your house. Put everything away, put your phones away, maybe sit down on the couch or somewhere else in, in, in the house. Each of you pour your favorite drinks, turn face to face staring at each other and talk. Just talk. Sometimes even when we go out on date nights, we don't really do that, right? We go to crowded, loud restaurants. You remember that? You remember restaurants? We used to go to those and hang out. We'll go to those, maybe not talk a whole ton, then we'll go watch a movie in a theater. You're not gonna talk during that, right? But maybe we've been gifted a ton of time at home right now so that we can start to date our spouse in new, unique ways. We can pursue loving our spouse. Here's another opportunity that you have. Our church is gonna host a Zoom call that anyone's open, uh, invited to join on Saturday nights it's going to be late, around 8 p.m. Um, if you would like to pipe in there, you don't have to share anything. You can just listen. We're going to share uh, kind of a devotional about marriage. We're going to talk about marriage, pray for our marriages. Um, we're going to fight for loving our spouses by just connecting with each other once a week on Saturday nights. Guys, there's opportunity here. Take it in your marriage. Maybe one result of this whole crazy mess is that God is going to bring out of this season of life a deepened love and strength in our marriages. How incredible would that be? Make the decision now that that's what you're going to be pursuing during this time because the new and living way that Jesus wants to approach life with during this season is to love our spouse. There's a fourth way. Look at verse 5. He says, Keep your life free from the love of money. Be satisfied with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you or abandon you. Therefore, we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Keep your lives free from the love of money. Be satisfied with what you have. Here's what the preacher's saying, real simply. Don't love money. Love something else. 
A life that's free from the love of money is a life that looks like satisfaction with what you have, right? Not constantly chasing the next thing that money can buy, the better car, the better house, the luxurious vacation. To be satisfied in this life without those things communicates a really powerful message. It communicates that you have supreme trust that God provides and that what he's providing you with is what he knows is best for you. That he's right there with you in whatever situation you're in because like he says there, he will never leave you or abandon you. To be satisfied in this life is to show that I love something more than money. So guys, when the savings account is dwindled, if some of the planned purchases for the future are impossible now, if the retirement fund gets totally wiped out, we have opportunity to show that our satisfaction doesn't come from these things. Those things are great, but we don't love them. We love something different that's more lasting. So the new and living way that Jesus opened up for us is that we love God more than anything else. We love God more than anything. And guys, that is such good news that Jesus inaugurated this for us. That there's something in this world that we can pursue and love and be excited about and have joy in more than money, more than stuff. It is good news that we can love God more than anything. Because read in verse 6 again where it says, the Lord is our helper. He is our helper. He's the one who actually helps us. Money will fail us. Investments can turn south. Things we buy with money fall apart, but God never leaves us or abandons us. And the new way of life that Jesus purchased for us is that we can love him, our one, our helper, who truly helps us. Loving God instead of loving money leads to a life of supreme satisfaction because we're loving something, someone, who can actually help us in all of life. But here's the thing, guys. Our love for God is only possible because of God's love for us. Maybe you've read John 3.16 before. Really familiar verse. Here's what it says. For God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Guys, in love, Jesus entered into this world to live for us to die for us, to defeat sin, death, and Satan for us by his perfect life and in his death in our place. In love, Jesus did all of this for you. And he was raised to life for this, that we would accept what he did for us, experience it ourselves, and that we would overflow with it and display his love in all of life that we would display his love to our brothers and sisters, that we would display his love to people who are hurting, that we would display his love to our spouse, that we would display his love for us back to him. Guys, we have incredible opportunity in this new and living way that Jesus has purchased for us to live. We can experience the love of Jesus. We can have it, believe it, be overwhelmed by it, be so satisfied in it that we're freed up to love others the way Jesus loved us. So I'm gonna pray that that's what God does in my life, in the life of everyone in our church that's listening to this, in your life if you're a guest just tuning into this, turning into our service for the first time. I'm going to pray that we would all be enraptured with, overwhelmed by the love of Jesus so that that's what would be flowing out of us during this time. Not fear, not self-protection, but love. Let me pray for that. So Father, I pray that you would show us more and more of the love of Jesus, that we would experience it, 
that we would be so overcome by it that that's just what uh, comes out of us in all of our relationships, in all of our interactions. God, show us ways that we can love other people, even during this time where it seems like relationships are separated and there's so much distance between people. God, show us ways that we can be fighting for love because you were raised for this. Jesus came, lived, died, and was raised so that we could display his love as we follow him. So I pray that you would do it in us and through us. In Jesus' name, amen. So guys, if you're new to checking out our church, this is one of your first times, uh, or you've never had a chance to talk with me and get to know things about our church, um, if you'd like to know more about Harbor Church West Oahu, or maybe you have some questions about who we are, or maybe you have some questions about what it means to follow Jesus, you're invited to meet with me tonight on Zoom. I'm going to host an open Zoom call for any guests in our church or, or anybody who's new and wants to connect in some ways or has questions. If that's you um, and you just want to get on and get to know me, um, maybe get to know some other people in our church, ask some questions, um, you're invited tonight to join us at 8 p.m. Sunday night, 8 p.m. Uh, the link for our Zoom call is down in the information um, under this video, so you can click on that and join us, and uh, we'd love to get to know you and talk to you more about the beauty of Jesus. So you're invited to that. Have a great week, and please, please reach out to us if you have any needs at all or know of someone who does, and we might be able to uh, pray for them or, or help meet those needs.